Proverbs 31, verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds a distaff and grasps a spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she's no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord, is to be praised. Honour her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And the second reading is from Titus, um, chapter 2, uh, which can be found on uh, page uh, 1198, uh, 1198. Um, in the uh, New Testament sections of the Bible uh, uh, in the pews. Uh, Titus 2. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed, because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal for them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. I well, do keep a, a Bible open at page 1198. Let's pray. Father God, we find it hard to live distinctive lives in a world that's lost without you. As we open our hearts to your word now, give us what we need to make a difference. Amen. What can you do if you're surrounded by lazy, lecherous liars? This was the problem in first century Crete. Um, Page 1198, we saw last week in Titus 1, verse 12, one of Crete's own prophets had said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. This was the problem that Paul had left Titus on the island to sort out. How? We saw last week it was by appointing elders pastor teachers to look after the churches in every town. It would be an uphill struggle for these elders, even within the churches. This is not a new problem for the Church of England. Even within the New Testament churches in Crete, planted by the Apostle, there are already people teaching distortions of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, but the merely human commands of those who reject the truth, verse 14. So Titus must rebuke these people and help them to be sound, healthy in the faith, and pay no attention to the false teaching. How's he going to do that? Surely if he just tells people not to be interested in it, they will get all the more intrigued by it. Chapter 2, verse 1, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. There is one truth. We saw last week that this truth is Jesus, the one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. He is the one truth for everyone. But then, Different strokes for different folks, as they say. The way he is taught is different for different people. Paul's instruction on how to teach is differentiated by age, sex, and social status. There's nothing wrong with recognizing the general differences between groups of people and having, for example, a ladies' Bible study, a youth group, a men's breakfast, a seniors' lunch club. Um, Chapter 2, verse 2, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Is there a danger that as we grow older men, we have a tendency to let ourselves go, to be less disciplined in life, to turn in on ourselves? In the Bible's way of thinking, retirement is not me time, a time to withdraw from thinking about others because I've done my bit, time to focus on ticking things off my bucket list. Older men need teaching to be sound in love and in endurance. We never stop serving the Lord Jesus who served us to the end. Never stop loving. Yes, we need to make way to let younger leaders through, which can be hard, but also keep on serving. Self-control was one of the many things to teach the older men. 
but it's the only thing mentioned to teach the younger men. In verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what's good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Self-control is the big issue for younger men. So Titus, as a minister, is to set an example for them, not leading out of anger or ego or sexuality, but doing what is good. Then look back at the teaching for older women. Do you recognize the dangers of the negatives here? Verse 3 Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. How destructive for a church if its older women are slandering other members of the church or bad-mouthing anyone and everyone. We've all seen it and how off-putting it can be. But we've also seen Wonderful examples of the positive as well. Older women living reverently and teaching what is good. There is a special teaching role for them. Nobody else can take this role in this way. Titus is not told to teach the younger women anything himself. Maybe it's wise for a male church leader to guard against spending too much time in ministry with attractive young women though he might feel excited by their attention. That's not what it's to be about. The older women are the best ones to teach the younger women. Verse 4, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. This may seem outdated. You can't say that these days, we might be thinking. Okay, there's nothing wrong with loving one's husband and children or being self-controlled and pure. In fact, if we think about it, we have to admit those are good things. But to be busy at home, seriously? I think our problem with this is partly from the English translation of a single word for busy at home which may conjure up narrow images for us of of a Victorian ideal housewife and the fear of being chained to the kitchen sink. It was good to hear Proverbs 31 as helpful background for recognizing that household management can involve complex international trade, great productivity, and not just staying in the house, cooking, cleaning, and waiting for the breadwinning husband to get home. Of course, in the first century, most industry would be cottage industry that households would work on together. So the husband would also be busy at home with his wife and the whole household. As it happens in our own family, since having children, Becky hasn't pursued her teaching career, but has been using her gifts teaching our own four children and serving in the church, out in junior church as she is now, every Sunday with the church children, and now running mini club for preschoolers and their grown-ups. And in fact, when I read Proverbs 31, I realize how blessed I am to be married to this woman. She may not have bought fields or planted vineyards, but when you see the rabbits and the vegetable planter in our garden and though I don't think she's selected flax. She uses eBay and finds the best deals on the internet. And you should see the things that she makes. It's not far off. Just like Proverbs 31, 28, her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Becky is able to support and supplement my ministry in the church in many ways that she wouldn't be able to if she had a job. But not every family works the same way. It may be in many families the most 
loving thing. And the best way to obey and apply Titus 2 is for younger women to go out to work. And there's nothing in Titus 2 to say they should not have a career. The other thing that perhaps we balk at is to be subject to their husbands. But there's nothing here to suggest husbands have the right to abuse or anything to place on wives any duty to tolerate abuse or stay where they're not safe. Being subject to one's husband does not mean submitting to abuse or immorality or even the beliefs of the husband. That said, it's not a feminist point either. It does mean supporting and encouraging one's husband to lead the family, I believe. Now, if a young woman doesn't feel inclined to follow this teaching, if she struggles to respect her husband, she wants to be in charge as she feels she knows better than he does, and her children are giving her a hard time, and she's exhausted and not feeling like loving them, and then being told these things by a man is probably not going to help. What she needs is some encouragement and urging on from someone who understands, someone who has been where she is and knows what it's like. God's word gives older women this special teaching role. What does it mean by older women? How old is an older woman? Well, no particular age, just a big sister to the person that she's encouraging. If we have siblings, we know how this works, even if we are, even when we are children. And it's lovely to see my beautiful young wife increasingly taking on this older woman role and not waiting till she's old. Mini club is a great example on a human level even though it's serving those outside the church and not just for church members. Mums with young children are looking for contact with other mums, friendship and support, and appreciate the conversations with people who have been where they are. There's practical wisdom to share when babies are crying, when working out feeding issues and nappies and behaviour, dealing with sleep deprivation. And it's just nice to have a coffee with someone who understands. So Sylvia and the refreshments team for Mini Club are, are not just there to make coffee and cut up fruit and put the dishwasher on. They can have an important role in having a chat with the people too. And maybe there are others hearing God's word and thinking about how you could do this as well. There's space in that team for more. Paul's teaching for younger women is quite focused on married life. But the principles apply for those who are not married as well, who might be single. Older brothers in the church family can encourage younger brothers. And any sister can encourage a younger sister. Surely someone who's been divorced or widowed or single for 20 years can help someone newer to the particular challenges and opportunities of the single adult life. And then at the end of Paul's list, there's great dignity for those members of the church who are slaves. It's not that Paul is approving of the institution of slavery. In fact, four pages back in our Bibles, being a slave trader in 1 Timothy 1.10 is on the list of terrible sins that Paul wrote. He's not approving of the institution of slavery, but slavery was a fact of life in the first century. And if you're a slave, Paul says, in that setting, there's no point being bitter about it, but actually you can be as faithful to God as your free brothers and sisters, and you can make a positive difference. Verse 10, and make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. This is a powerful way to live for powerless people. 
how can anyone do it in a hostile environment where people are out of control? And how can we gain this self-control? Where does the, the inner resource come from? The answer to that is in the gospel, the teaching about God our Saviour, Jesus. The motivation to live a good life is not a stick to beat ourselves with. Be good or God will get you. The gospel works to change us positively from the heart so that we want to do good. The gospel message that we hear is how we start the Christian life. And it's the same gospel that is also how we grow in the Christian life. This is how it works. We didn't go looking for salvation. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. He, Jesus, revealed salvation. And he, Jesus, or in the terms of this passage, it, grace, works a time-shifting miracle. That was in the past, has appeared. This is a, a Christmas Day reading in the church's lectionary for a reason. But we saw last week, Titus 1 verse 3, that it is brought to light through the preaching of the gospel. Jesus appears now. And he, God's grace, verse 12, teaches us it, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. The gospel of grace transforms our lives and can transform our society. How? Verse 14, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. It's through Jesus' atoning death he gave himself. This is very personal again. It's not just a concept. Jesus gave himself. And he binds us to himself as his possession for all eternity. This gives us a change of identity. Our new identity is as those who belong to Jesus. We have an unbreakable connection with Jesus. So we walk with him. We can't stay living as we were or as we would be without him. This is not moralism, the sense that God's approval goes up and down with our behavior, so we'd better be good or Santa Claus will give us a lump of coal. The follower of Jesus is driven to good behavior not by fear or merit or even by gratitude, trying to pay him back and feeling guilty about how much he gave for us, but driven by grace, grace shown to us in the past as Jesus died on the cross, in the present as he appears to us through preaching, and grace in the future as, verse 13, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. This is the return of Christ, when every knee will bow before him and he'll raise all who belong to him to be with him in glory forever. This message is the power of God for salvation and this message is what empowers right living today. Let's pray. Praise you, Lord Jesus, for being grace in the flesh. Thank you for appearing 2,000 years ago. Thank you for appearing now when you're talked about. And thank you that you will appear to give us all the good things we don't deserve. Thank you for making us your people. Work that grace into our hearts, we pray, that we might have better control of ourselves and resist the things that other people can't stop themselves chasing after. 
Help us to do our work in a way that makes your teaching attractive to others. Keep us from giving grounds to anyone to say bad things about your church or your word and make us sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Amen. Thank you, John T. We now uh, come to say uh, the words of the creed together and, and 